We do not have prosperity unless we have natural resources. This is a line that my good colleague, friend, and Twin Global co-founder, Peter Bryant, has been on for many years. In fact, he introduced me to the whole field of mining and resources about 20 years ago. And so I am so happy to have him and Gretchen and Jose Antonio here to address this topic. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Ron. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Who's inspired? No? Who's had? Who's been challenged? Yeah, I hope all of you do one thing differently when you leave Twin Global. One thing, personal or professional. Well, we're really, uh, we've got 18 minutes, so we're going to do a sprint on one of the most consequential issues facing humanity today, and that is the energy transition. Uh, we've got Gretchen and Jose Antonio here, which are you know, two amazing people that know this world so well. Uh, before I uh, hand over to Gretchen to kick off, I want to frame this discussion because I think the media and activists uh, give it a very simplistic framing, uh, and it's a very, very complex, difficult topic. Uh, so, and I'll frame it in three ways. One is that we have the urgency uh, of acting on climate change. There's no doubt about that. It is urgent. But at the same time, we must deliver affordable, reliable, and accessible energy to all consumers, uh, whether you're residential or business. And cleaner is preferable, but don't sacrifice the first three for the fourth. And I would say about 80 or 90% of consumers would think that. Okay, and there's another complication, which a lot of people don't know. There's approximately probably one to one and a half billion people that actually don't have electricity. Imagine your life without electricity. No lights, no heating, no hot showers, no air conditioning. Kids can't do homework. It is horrible. And that's further complicated by the fact that the two to three billion people that are arriving on this planet, many of them are actually in the same areas where there is no electricity. Okay, so that's the second framing. And the third one is act on climate change, deliver that energy at the same time as you're growing prosperity for all people in your individual countries and on the planet. And every country has issues. And you know, we're delighted to have Con uh, Jose Antonio from Ecuador. So we have a developing country's perspective, which is very different from that of America and Europe and the developed world. Um, so it's within that context that we're going to have this discussion. So I'm going to, uh, so Gretchen is uh, with Shell, uh, a leading energy company. And Gretchen, I mean, you guys have done some, uh, some really serious looking at this topic and uh, at the heart of the energy transition. So how, you, how are you dealing with this? How do you think about it? Yeah, thanks, Peter. So at Shell, actually, one of the things we constantly remind ourselves is that we're trying to deliver more and cleaner energy, mm -hmm. um, very much aligned with, with how you framed this up. And um, there, are, there are over a billion people uh, around the world without access to energy, and there's hundreds of millions more that, that don't have reliable energy. So it might be on sometimes, but not all the time if you turn your lights on or turn on the heater. Um, and so when we look at that, we look at, okay, so if we're going to continue to provide consumers and customers, and frankly, also enable people to rise out of poverty uh, by accessing energy, that's certainly a component of, of raising people out of poverty, how do we continue to provide products that, that our customers want right. um, while lowering, lowering the, the carbon impact on the world? And so um, one of the things that we have done at Shell is we have um, made a couple of commitments actually more um, aggressive commitments, I would say, than not just our peer group in our industry, but actually in industry in general. Um, so we've, we are targeting to uh, reduce our net carbon footprint um, by 30, by 20% by 2035 and by 50% by 2050. And when we say net carbon footprint, that's not just the emissions that we create through what we do, whether it's um, a chemical plant or refining for uh, gasoline for, for cars. It's also looking at the units of, uh, of energy that we sell. So if you go fill up your uh, car at the Shell station on the corner, we're taking into account the emissions that your car will take, okay. uh, will put into the air. And so we've set very, very aggressive targets around all emissions, including the ones created by our products, 
but we've also tied that to our executive pay. So my, my salary is tied to our ability to achieve those goals. Um, so the whole company, very much our decisions about whether to invest in certain projects, about whether to invest in certain countries, about whether to partner with other companies, is all looked at through that lens. And it's very important to note that the bonus system is tied to that because we get the behavior we reward, right? Exactly. So I think that's pretty potent. Yeah. Cool. So we'll go Jose Antonio, so Ecuador, visiting there in March, April, as we talked about. Uh, so DPI is doing work. That's how we got onto Jose Antonio. So Ecuador is a great country. Just a few facts, 16 million people. A per capita, $6,500, okay? And I know, and one of the richest biodiversities of any country in the world, which is fantastic. <laughs> I heard you had 250 versions of hummingbirds, which is hard to believe, but that's amazing. But I think, you know, and talking to your minister and Fernando and all that is that, I mean, you've got this real difficulty of, you've, you're rich in resources, so you're trying to develop your resources to rise prosperity. You have a pretty aggressive climate change goal of your own, and you, at the same time, you're trying to lift prosperity up for your people all at the same time. Now, that, I mean, that's a real balancing act. So do you want to kind of shine a light on Ecuador and what you're doing? And sure, I mean, thanks for the invite first. Love, love being here. Ecuador is a country that has a small surface. Nevertheless, we, are the most bio, we have the most biodiverse place on Earth. And on that place, we have the biggest oil, oil field that we have discovered in Ecuador. So it's really difficult to say, do I leave it un under Earth or I start developing? We have taken an approach that we think is the one that tries to balance that out and say, how can I develop that in a sense that I don't um, make it wrong for, for nature in that place? So for example, what we do is we use offshore technology onshore on those places which are right, uh, really sensible. Um, and then we have done a lot. I mean, Ecuador is one of the only countries where nature has rights in the constitution. Oh, really? Which is another thing. I was last time with somebody from Sierra Club, mm -hmm. and he was so eager to talk about the rights of nature in the constitution. I said, OK, I come from the oil sector, so we respect those rights, but we have to, to manage also the rights of our people. And then there's another question that is really important to, to ask yourself. What's development? I mean, for us, development is to have education, to have healthcare, to have those kind of things. But maybe for the communities, that's not development. For the communities, development is to be one with nature, to live like they have lived the past thousand years. So that's another balancing act that the government has to make. How do I foster development, but the development that they want or that they are aiming? So it's not always easy. We are really blessed as a country, as you said. We have the Galapagos Island, which is also another laboratory, and everybody's welcome to come. <laughs> uh, and we just Us is leaving in half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and we just discovered the, probably the biggest silver mine in the world underground, the third biggest gold mine, and sixth biggest copper mine. So it's, it's truly an amazing country, but we are really responsible. If you look at our energy grid, our, of our uh, to our ele electricity matrix, we generate about 90% from renewables. Mm. So we did the first step of energy transition. We clean up the electricity grid. Now what we have to do is electrifying other consumers, yes. moving out from, from diesel for transport. EVs is a big thing that we have. From 2025, we will not uh, import any more combustion engine vehicles for public transport, for example. That's a policy that we have done. And from the ministry, that's, that's kind of, of what we think uh, the government should do. The government is, is an enabler for energy transition. We have to set up the, the framework, but then it's a thing from the private sector, from the consumer, which moves that framework around. Yeah. So it's, it's an effort from all, and that's what we are doing. Really hard. And hopefully build your per capita GDP up, right, and bring people yeah. out. That's cool. And I think one of the key things you said, I think, is this whole what one person's uh, version of development is, is totally different for another. And we and I always think we have to be careful as Westerners not to impose our views on them. Uh, Gretchen, you know this question's coming, because you have to, you know, I mean, the cynics in the audience and out there say, ah, oh, Shell's an oil and gas company. Of course it would say that, but it's going to continue to be an oil and gas company uh, into the future. How, how do you kind of uh, comment against that, or to that? Yeah. People say that. So I, um, I've spent, 29 years in, uh, in energy, oil and gas. I'm, I'm an engineer. Um, I uh, found myself at sort of a career crossroads about uh, two years ago. 
Um, the company I was with was being sold, and, and so I, I started looking around, what do I want to do next? Um, and it's, it's, it's great that the theme today is around purpose, because it was a, a time of reflection for me about what is my purpose going forward, and what I really decided personally is that I, I wanted to be part of creating the future of energy. Um, I wanted to be part of a company that was doing that. So, um, yes, I love technology. I get really jazzed about some of the really cool technical um, you know, innovations that we have in Shell and, frankly, in the industry. Um, I've been privileged to live and work in six different countries around the world, but I thought, you know, what I really want to do is, is be part of creating something great. Mm. Um, and so Shell, in my view, is, is really the company that is right smack on the leading edge of of, of basically putting, we're putting our money where our mouth is about, about cleaning up the environment, about being committed to Paris, um, the, the, you know, no more than two degrees. Um, we've put out actually a scenario called the sky scenario, you can see it online, but it is, it paints a, a vision, a picture of how that is a technically possible to achieve the goals of Paris. Now, I, where we sit right now, it, it does not look great. Um, but there are technically possible ways of doing that, and we are investing in those ways. Things like uh, carbon capture, like I said, we are trying to provide cleaner energy solutions for our customers. I mean, just to give you an example, we have customers, uh, we're one of the biggest um, gas and power marketers in North America. And so we have customers, some of the big tech companies that you've heard of, maybe even that are here today, that come to us and say, look, you know, our customers are demanding us reduce, that we reduce our carbon footprint. So can you help us build an energy portfolio that gets us there? And we can do that because we have access to, and, and frankly, generate renewable power from solar, from wind. Um, and we can put together a portfolio that says this year your, your, all of your energy meet, needs will be met by 20% renewables and the balance um, you know, natural gas. And next year it'll be 30% and the following year 40%. So we're able to provide cleaner yeah. solutions for our customers. And frankly, I think that's, that's our role in, yeah. in the world. So cynics should not be too cynical, right? No, I, I mean, so, yeah, yeah I, think that's, I think that's true. I mean, yeah. we, we certainly can't be the sole solution. Um, and uh, one of the things we're working really hard right now on, and, and you will see us out in the public talking quite a bit about working uh, across boundaries of industries, working with coalitions. The folks that were here right before were saying, you know, reach out to governments. We are reaching out to governments. We're working very closely with some governments um, to, to not only set goals, but, you know, how, how do we abate some really hard, how do we m mitigate some really hard to abate sectors like airlines and shipping across the ocean and you know what are the what are the fuels of the future that are going to allow those industries to continue while still reducing their carbon footprint and so it's it's fuels like lng it's fuels like hydrogen and we're in right in the middle of having conversations with the airlines with the transportation yeah. companies with the governments regulations do, do pay, play a part in that okay. as well so it's a nice lead in for jose antonio but i think what government's role in ecuador I mean, obviously, you know, coalitions, you've got a lot of interests within Ecuador. How do you approach this kind of whole coalition, multi-stakeholder kind of environment uh, to, get, to move the dial for your country? It's an easy question, Peter. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean... And who's got the best socks, by the way? We're going to have a sock thank you, vote. I'm thank telling you. you. I, uh, I was expecting that sorry, you Gretchen. notice and <laughs> we me. can do uh, oh, a contest. I'm admiring them. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it, it's, it's not easy, mm. but I think it goes from dialogue from construction, and I think um, the team of Twin has been vision, you know, vision. And I think this, this kind of settings help us having the uh, shared vision. Mm. And once you have vision, you can start working on that. So that's important. I think in the world as a whole, everybody is mindful that energy transition is key and is maybe the single most important thing that we will achieve in our lifetime. Mm because that's the difference between having a sustainable earth or not sustainable earth. And in that sense, the dialogue is quite easy, you know, because it's either we do it or we don't make it. Uh, nevertheless, of course, anybody has his, uh, everybody has his own interests, and sometimes you have to take an approach as government to say, this is the way forward, and this is where we are moving. 
Yeah. And that's, that's difficult when you have to take that hard line, but oh. it's not out of the question. So uh, we've got three minutes left, so I'll give you a, a f or four minutes. Uh, a question, and it's <laughs> kind of interesting because we live on a planet. We don't live in America, we live on a planet. This is a planetary problem. And you look at every projection for oil and for coal, which is, you know, and the U.S. is probably, I think U.S. will be effectively out of coal because of natural gas in five years. You know, be marginal. But coal uh, as a generation fuel is on, for the next 30 years will grow at 3% per annum because of China and Africa and India, you know, consuming coal. Um, oil's the same as people rise up. You know, it's just this demand side. So, you know, here we are in the U.S. and Europe and all that. So, you know, how do we balance this kind of global issue? Because we can do stuff and that's great. But at a global basis, you know, we're not making a dent because other people are wanting the things we're trying to lower down. So I'd just be interested how you kind of view that. Uh, what's the, is there, I don't know if there's a solution, but how, how do you look at that? Oh, in the well, I mean, I, sure. there you go, first question. I yeah. think um, it, it is a global issue. And, mm. and so, uh, and, and frankly, the reason we want to provide more <laughs> yeah. energy, but cleaner energy yeah. is, is because of that reason, that, that very reason. And so I think um, we can't limit people's accessibility to power, um, but we can provide um, reliable and low-cost energy from other sources than mm. coal. Yeah. Um, we very much feel that natural gas, although still a fossil fuel, plays a huge role in that. That's it's true. one of the reasons why we've invested so heavily in that. Mm -hmm. um, natural gas is a, is a fuel that you can transport easily to different parts of the yep. world, and we are working, working to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think the other thing is, again, this sort of, this sort of cross-sector mm. collaboration is it's, absolutely yeah. needed. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, that, that we won't be able to solve this problem globally or in a country setting without that kind of collaboration. Yeah. And Shell's just, your CEO, Ben, has just started a coalition of crossing the whole value chain and the belief that you've got to have the whole value chain end to end he work has. on this collective yes. director. Yeah, because, you, you know, we've... Uh, uh, we, we have shareholders yes. um, that expect a certain level of return. Yeah. And so um, we are looking for ways to make commercial um, cleaner energy solutions. So it is, it is absolutely driven by um, the pace of society, the pace of our shareholders. Um, we're investing over the next six years, we're going to be investing between two and four billion dollars a year, uh, billion dollars in clean energy solutions. Not all of that is going to make a return for us, but um, we're, we're investing more than, than, yeah. than most others. Sure. Um, and, and that's what needs to happen, frankly, because if there's going to be a winner on the other side of that, um, both for climate and for sort of our shareholders, yeah. it's, gonna, it's only going to come from, from going out and trying these yeah, things. Providing the options. Jose Antonio, last word. <laughs> TikTok. <laughs> yeah, sure. Look, I think um, as mankind, we have done a great job in awareness raising regarding the issue of energy transition and climate war and global warming. But we haven't come to uh, agreement on how we implement that. Mm. Now we have great intentions and great projects from the likes of Shell and other companies that feel that they are responsible with the environment, but we have to come to an agreement on a kind of carbon tax or that kind of stuff which sets up the incentives in the same way. So to say, if I'm carbon free, I am more profitable, and so my shareholders push me to that. Mm. Uh, if my country generates more clean air, my country has an income source that allows that country to keep up the, the jungle, the biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we have to, to, to look into ourselves and see that in this transition, there will be winners and losers, because yes. that's the nature of transition. But we have to have a mechanism that aligns those interests because the global interest is to have a, a, con uh, a world that is viable. Yep. And if we don't come to realize that, maybe it's too late once we want to put those incentives in yeah, place. Exactly. And again, it's rewarding the behavior we seek, right? Exactly. Don't, right. So uh, we're down to zero. So usually <laughs> I do a summary, but I won't because Rob will kill me. So Gretchen, Jose Antonio, thank you. And I hope thank you've you got a uh, different perspective a little bit on the energy transition. And uh, we look forward to talking with you further. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you.